Things were never smooth for Jack and his mom. Jack was an artist from birth, and he lost his father when he was just a kid. He grew up in the hands of his mom in a single-room apartment. They were their neighbors themselves, as no one in the neighborhood wanted to associate with them. Jack's mom, Ms. Jane, had gone from one menial work to another to put food on the table for herself and her poor son. She often joined combined three works in a day to provide for his autistic son, who she had earlier enrolled in one of the best schools in the city. Her neighbors often laughed and made fun of her for being poor and having expensive taste. They talked behind her back as they were awed why she had decided to send her son to the almighty St. Hallmarks amongst all other affordable schools where her caliber often sent their kids. After several unanswered questions from these busybodies, they challenged Miss Jane about why she had to risk all that for her kid. In her words, she replied to her critics by saying, even though I'm poor, I wouldn't want my son to grow up in the circle of the mediocre. Growing up and mixing with the kids of the rich will help my son build a sharp mindset toward money and have a better connection that will eventually help him in the future. I wouldn't mind working all around the clock to give my son the best. Some of these critics saw some sense in the reason behind her actions, while some called her dumb and criticized her further. Ms. Jane seemed unbothered as she still ran three to four jobs to achieve her dream for her son. She had one full-time job and two part-time. She was a full-time janitress. She always resumed work as early as 6 a.m. and close around 5 p.m., granting her the rest of the day to settle down for her other jobs. Who said it was easy? It was never easy. Sometimes she missed sleep as she had to prepare for the next day. She had to take care of her autistic son and prepare his meal before he left for school. Jack was a term in high school. His experience had been terrific as he wasn't getting any fun from school. He was bullied every day by his classmates. This must have been because of his health conditions and his mom's financial status. He came from a different world from the other students. They avoided him like the plague. He tried making friends with them, but they knocked him in the head or kicked him in the ass, yelling at him to stay away from them. He soon started isolating himself. As if that was enough for these bullies, they still went for him in his isolation. They would drag him and make jest of him for being physically impaired. They laughed at him because his mom was a janitor in a small company down the road, and she had to sponsor his education with the stipends she was earning. Their teacher witnessed their callous and uncultured acts towards the poor Jack, and she chastised them for it. She asked that they apologize to him and never try such again. Jack felt so bad about the ridicule his classmates and schoolmates generally made out of him. He was pain to the bone marrow. He wanted to change the narrative. He felt so pissed with himself and concluded he wouldn't let himself remain public trash where everyone dumps insults, and for his poor mom, he was going to do something. Jack decided to go out all to make life better for himself and his mom, and at least stop being a piece of mockery, and most significantly, stop his mom from working as a janitor. That was his utmost drive. He started working. He tried to sell his services. In the bid, he became a freelancer online since he had learned some skills on YouTube. The design had always got his attention, and he breathed it. Even in his subconsciousness, or whenever he was lost in his thought, he would draw on the ground with his index finger, trying to craft a new design. His classmates called him weird for that, so he took his time to learn it extensively. He became very good at it, and his talent had just met professionalism. He started selling his skill on freelance websites and making some cool cash. 
He was ecstatic the day he got his first project. He couldn't hold his joy as he jumped without bothering about his condition. Tears flowed down his cheeks like a baby. You would think he was just declared the next president of the U.S. The project was just a $10 work. It was small, but he didn't mind. It was not really about the money to him, but the fact that he could get hired and paid afterward swept him off his feet. When his mom returned, he quickly ran to her and hugged her. The mom was shocked to have seen her son happy again after the tough times he had been going through in his school. She couldn't help but wonder what had got Jack very pleased, but she sure knew there was a reason behind his strange happiness. In a keen voice, she asked him, My baby, what is it? Jack told his mom about the good news, and he promised to make sure she stopped working as a janitor. He executed the project diligently, and he was rewarded suit. He got another work after a week. This time, it was $50. He was convinced this was the pace setter for him and his mom. He pleaded with his mom to quit her full-time job while he took care of them. However, he tried to calm him to take things slowly. She would stop eventually, but it wasn't time yet. He wasn't pleased with his mom's decision, but gave in after several persuasion from the mom. Six months down the line, Jack had been able to amass thousands of dollars. He was able to do this with his beautiful creativity and hard work. He had sleepless nights and sometimes missed school to meet up with deliveries. He didn't touch his earnings. He saved them on this trusted website. But the unexpected happened. The website crashed and he lost all his hard-earned savings. Jack became depressed. This didn't seem too good for Jack. He grew lean within a few weeks as he wouldn't eat but cry all night. His mom consoled him, but he wasn't getting all of that. All he wanted was a miracle. He wanted his money. He had too many plans for the money. That was the money he had planned to establish his mom with. He felt so discouraged. Building and nurturing a new account from scratch wasn't a quick bone to break. The market got competitive by the day. He had no access to any of his top clients again, and he had no way to reach them as they only transacted on the website, as that was the policy. The platform promised to kick back and pay up every freelancer affected by the unfortunate technical problem. Jack waited about two months to get a response from them, but nothing seemed forthcoming, and every action to reach out to their customer support was futile. Jack accepted his fate and decided to channel his determination towards something else. This time, he started working for a logistics company. He helped people clean up their apartments and got paid stipends, and he did this for months, even though it wasn't advisable for his health. His mom warned him to stop because of his health status, but Jack was too determined to stop her mom from working as a janitor and raise cash again so he could establish her. Unfortunately, his mom became ill. She was diagnosed with complications because of stress and the humid, filthy places she was working. She was forced to stop working as a janitress, at least pending the time she recovered. They had to keep her on medications to aid her recovery. Drugs were expensive, and hospital admission was more expensive. Jack spent all the money he had saved on her mom's health so she could be okay again. He exhausted everything he had. He had to double his hustle to keep the mom fine and save her from dying. He decided to add delivery work to his cleaning job. This time, he had to combine academics with his two challenging jobs. He would rush to school every morning after having a short sleep. He would leave school before the usual time to resume his cleaning. He would joggle his schedule to meet up with clients' deliveries. Sometimes he delivered late and got several lashbacks from their clients. The company he was working for had sanctioned him twice and threatened that on the third strike he would be dismissed. In the run to save his mom, trying to see her mom get back on her feet, 
Jack faced some health problems, nervousness, and panic attacks. He was weak and vulnerable. The health problems were highly expected. An autistic guy like him shouldn't stress himself too much, but Jack couldn't help. He had responsibilities on his shoulder. His mom asked him to stop worrying about her and that she would be fine. The doctors restricted him from working. This is the end, he thought, as tears dropped in his eyes. The doctors supervised Jack for one week to ensure that he didn't sneak to work behind their backs. After a week, he got a bit better and returned to the company he was working for. Sadly, the company hired someone to take his place since he was absent for a week with no upfront notice. He tried explaining to them that he had been ill and was under strict orders not to leave the hospital, but they weren't patronizing him. After a lot of pleas, he had to leave there with shame. Tears had gathered around his eyes and blurred his sight as he walked like a helpless beggar. He also rammed into a car that was coming without even noticing. The man's honking at him brought him back to reality. The man cursed him and went his way. Jack couldn't even pick a fence because he was the one at fault. He walked down to the hospital where his mom was admitted. As he got to the hospital entrance, he slipped and slumped, hitting his arm hard on the floor. Immediately, he lost consciousness. The nurses ran towards him and rushed him into the emergency ward, a different ward from his mom's. After a few hours, he sneezed from his deep sleep and opened his eyes. The doctors calmed him down and assured him everything was okay. They handed him the handkerchief and his phone that had fallen off his back pocket after he slumped. He asked about his mom, and they told him she was sleeping, and she didn't even know about what had happened to him. He collected his phone. He noticed he had missed calls from his mom and a mail notification displaying on his phone lock screen, but ignored the mail. He unlocked his phone to call his mom and assure her he was fine. Having unlocked his phone, he could read the mail's headline. Surprisingly, it was from the freelance platform he was working with and had all his savings stuck in after they experienced a severe technical setback. The headline read, Hi, dear Jack, we are back and we are stronger. He was astonished. He quickly clicked the mail to read up on everything. Yes, it was that great news he had been waiting for. He quickly signed in and it was accessible. He jumped up and screamed. His right arm was bandaged and healing, but it didn't matter. His scream got everyone's attention, including the doctors, and they all ran into his ward thinking something terrible had happened. He asked the doctors how much their bill was, and they told him. He assured them he would be back the following day. He dashed out, headed to his mom's ward, and wrapped his hands around her. He shared the good news with her, and she was elated, too. Jack demanded a withdrawal of all his savings. The request was granted after he was able to verify that he owned the account. After 12 hours, his earnings were sent to his mom's history, which he had linked as his beneficiary. The following day, he cleared all their bills, and they were still left with a considerable amount to establish his mom just like he had envisioned. The mom was admitted after a week. Jack resumed school and had access to his clients who had missed him. They started working together on new projects while Jack's mom quit her job as a janitor and started her own business. Jack's bullies stopped bullying him too. They were able to get a mini supermarket for his mom in a commercial area. Both the autist guy and his janitor's mom lived a better and happier life ever after. They hate me. I can see it in their eyes. They hate me, all of them, she whispered. Who hates you? He was getting impatient with her repeating the same verse repeatedly. Everyone does. They all hate me, despite everything I do. They don't like me. 
Why can't anyone like me? Why can't they see my strengths? The conversation he had earlier with a lady was replaying in his mind as he tried to calm down under the harmony of the relaxing music. He came to this concert to relieve himself a bit from the daily burden of his job, but he could not get rid of his exchange with one of his patients. You said you tried everything. What did you do? He asked her. She took a moment to reply and said, Nothing. I can't do anything. Sometimes I am too weak. And it seems like I don't have the physical strength. And sometimes I don't feel myself. As if they tricked me. Or even worse, they hid me somewhere. From where I cannot return. No matter how hard I try. She was speaking in a trance and was annoying the hell out of her psychologist. He loved his job, but he hated weak women. And she was weak, at least according to him. I don't feel an ounce of happiness inside me. Her lips quivered as she continued, as if I have no right to be happy anymore. Maybe you need to try to be braver. Try a bit harder to feel the emotion, he replied. I am brave, and I am trying. But sometimes only trying isn't enough, is it? She wasn't looking into his eyes. Yeah, I can see that he thought as the pencil in his hand was on the verge of splitting into two. Rolling the same pencil between his fingers, he sat down in the front row. There was an expensive-looking fancy piano at the bottom of the stage. Its pristine curved hardwood was shining under the bright chandelier. This masterpiece was indeed the center of attention of the whole theater, until someone else took its place, until she came into view. The charm of the majestic instrument began to fade as she approached the grand piano. Dressed in a knee-length white frock with her hair pinned on the top in a bun, she looked like an angel descending directly from the heavens. She ran a delicate finger across the curved body of hardwood, as if it were rare and vulnerable. He knew that this piano's heart was made from the same red spruce trees used for crafting Stradivari's violin. Yet it looked less valuable in front of the lady who was about to play it. Am I annoying you? she asked somehow noticed his lack of interest in her conversation, and asked, No, you're not annoying me, he deliberately lied. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I was making you bored with my non-stop chanting. She showed her concern. No, you're not, he suppressed a yawn. You are just making me angry with your weakness. Why can't you take a stand for yourself? You're not a child anymore. He could only think of that. Eden Smith was a successful psychologist who lived and practiced in Los Angeles for the past 20 years. Shayla was his patient who was going through a rough time. She annoyed him with her hopelessness. At first, he made a tremendous effort to cope with the irritation, but all in vain. Then his fury became visible in his expressions. It wasn't normal for him to loathe his patients, but he couldn't help himself in her case. According to him, Shayla was a typical fragile woman. They were not only nervous, weak, dependent, and less adapted to life, but it was also her fault. Because she had been going through hard times for the past 40 years, the psychologist believed that her weak character caused her failures in her personal life, and it was in her hand to switch these feelings. All the sessions he had with her left him more exhausted than ever, so he decided to alleviate his nerves by attending a concert but he wasn't prepared for what life was about to unfold for him. The artist, standing beside the piano, turned and faced the audience. Eden felt astonished as he realized that the face he had been trying to get rid of all evening was standing in the middle of the stage. Shayla stood there, surrounded by spotlights, looking perfect in her attire. Yet, she seemed feeble. Or it was his imagination. She took her position behind the keys and closed her eyes, as her fingers touched the cold surface. Inhaling a deep breath, she fingered through the slow-building start of Hate by Lucas King. As the composition changed, the tempo grew into a heavier and more aggressive tone. Every muscle in her body was engrossed in it. Her hips swayed, her head rocked, and her fingers did wonders on the keys. It looked like she was possessed by acoustics. He was amazed, seeing her consumed in her music, and generating a song with this perfection shocked him. He listened in fascination as beautiful music flowed from under the fluttering hands of this lady. The delightful lady he failed to judge. 
The majestic composition propelled her to the top note as she banged her hands along the keys. She was wrestling with the piano and testing its limit, and somehow she was pushing her limits too. Her face was mournful, her lips were compressed together, and her lush hair pinned high gave some loose strands to cover her face. She was stunning when she played the beautiful music. I have been through a lot. I think I will never reach where I want to go. She started with confusion. Where do you want to go? Failing miserably at hiding his irritation, Eden asked her. I don't know. This is the actual problem that I don't know. Shayla shrugged her shoulders. Then who knows, if not you? He asked politely. Don't know. There are a lot of places I want to visit. A lot of things, titles, awards I want to get. But I don't have the strength to walk a step towards them. The things she said earlier in the sessions made sense. He understood her better while sitting in front of the piano rather than in his office. Her music displayed her doubts, hopelessness, and misconceptions altogether. Do you think I will ever get what I want? She asked with the hope of hearing yes in reply. He saw this hope in her eyes. Do you think I will achieve what I crave? Eden nodded his head in disagreement and said, No, certainly not with this attitude of yours. It is a big no. You will never be able to achieve your goals. You will never see an ounce of happiness with this attitude. He burst her bubble of hope and brought her out of her daydreaming. She remained silent for a whole minute. I kept looking at the floor. The dirt on the mat was making fun of her. And then she whispered, That was rude. Shella nodded her head. That was rude of you to say this. I said what I saw. He defended his hate. Then you saw it wrong. I'm a little misguided now, but I know I will reach there. Or I will never reach there. She was indeed trying to reach somewhere. It was evident by her restlessness. However, it was uncertain from her expression if she had reached her destination or not. She was not misguided as she claimed to be. Instead, she was not guided at all. And Eden felt ashamed of himself for not providing her with anything helpful. He scratched a finger down his whiskered throat and yanked on the collar behind his tie so he could breathe easily. He saw her as a weak woman who was depressed, unbalanced, and an infantile woman. He kept blaming her, her childishness, and non-seriousness for her discomfort but he did not spend a moment understanding her essence. Eden was repenting that despite the troubles in her life, he never appreciated her strong personality. He never told her that everything would turn out to be okay. His misconception blindfolded him. He forgot that outside of his office, there is a life that this weak, thin woman somehow copes with and has been living for more than 40 years. He never thought she could give such a brilliant performance that would leave hundreds of people in complete awe. Sitting in a concert, he realized a life lesson that nobody knows anymore. Either they evaluate only what they want to see or what is available for them to consume. He learned that in our life, we do not always look attractive, successful, or confident all the time. We possess different powers and abilities that others cannot see. People only look a little bit in the crack of their life and jump to conclusions. They get blindfolded by their rush and then repent later. And he didn't think about who she was in this life. Then the thought of getting to know her better crossed his mind and left him baffled. He didn't realize that love had happened to him. And not just any love, the kind that the French call sunstroke. It happens unexpectedly and leaves you with nothing but a burn. He suddenly felt a surge of happiness seeping inside of him at the thought, but it soon transformed into discontentment as he remembered the last words of Shayla. You never really tried to understand me, right? She asked him while looking into his eyes for the first time. What made you think that? Eden went into defensive mode and countered her with a question. You never asked me why I felt such things. I don't remember you showing interest in any of my hobbies. Not that I have many, but you should have at least inquired about them. She rested her back against the comforter and kept asking him questions he had no answers to. You said I would never reach there. Maybe you are right or maybe you are wrong. But the way you said that wasn't ethical at all. She accused him of non-professionalism, to which Eden had no answers. He knew she was right, but he didn't let his conscience take over his pride. You are wrong, 
he argued in a meek tone. We both know who is wrong, Mr. Smith. Thank you for your time. I will not say it was a nice meeting with you, because it wasn't, and she left. Eden replayed her last sentences repeatedly in his mind and saw her fingers easing down the keys. She was reaching the end of her music. The audience was getting ready to stand in their seats to appreciate her. They were about to stand for the woman he labeled weak and found irritating. He realized that people hold the power to reveal what they want you to see and hiding what they don't feel like sharing. They may be confused or weak at one thing and at the same time be a master of the other. He failed himself when he judged a book by its cover. He should have asked her about things that made her strong. He should have asked her what she does outside of her room. Where does she want to go? What does she want to achieve? It was the only way to know her better. It was the only way of soothing the burning sensation in his heart. And this is how fate played him. This is how karma worked. He fell in love with the woman he should have helped. I was always different than the other girls. For one thing, I was dimmed less pretty than the other girls in my school, and they always thought I was more boyish than the rest of them. Another thing, maybe the most important thing, was that I could see light when I got angry and burn everything in my path. Funny how I always seemed to do that, both literally and figuratively. Standing in front of my classmates yet again, I was listening to their taunts. I felt myself heat up. This happened every time I was angry. She's so different from the rest. She's rather ugly, isn't she? I don't think any boy would go for a girl like that. Don't make her angry or she'll come undone. You know they call her Dragon Girl. They started laughing at the statement. Sometimes I wonder if they thought I didn't have feelings just because I had special abilities. I felt the anger coursing through me as they kept speaking and making taunts in my direction. One of the girls pushed me and I fell back, hitting me behind on the floor. I couldn't take it anymore. I got up and yelled back at them. I couldn't stop myself and I realized it before it was too late. I had consumed everything in my path. There was a lot of damage done, Mr. Kelly, I heard an officer say to someone standing beside me. I was covered with the towel as the sirens sounded and the firefighters filled the surroundings around me. I heard my father grunt beside me shaking his head in shame. His daughter had done it again, bringing dishonor to the family. He and my mother had always tried to change me, to make me a better person, but it never turned out the way they wanted it to. And who could blame them? I was the one that couldn't control my powers, not them. We're so sorry for the damage, I heard him say to the fireman beside him. Rest assured, we will pay for everything, and a generous donation will go to the school help everyone recover. He said the last bit quietly and I knew what he meant. It was a bribe to keep their mouths shut. He didn't want anyone to find out about this. It would be bad for my father. He was one of the most prestigious businessmen in town. This wouldn't be good publicity for him. He shook hands with the man while I kept my head down, afraid to look into his disappointed face because I knew he wore that expression as he spoke. It's time to go home he said stiffly, placing a hand on my shoulder to direct me towards his car, parked not far away from the school's grounds. Your mother will be so disappointed, Grace. I winced. Using my middle name was always a way of communicating the disdain my parents sometimes felt for me. It always made me shiver. It meant things had gone terribly. I walked towards the passenger side of the car. I could feel the eyes looking at me intently. It was always unnerving because it never helped that I had crippling anxiety. I got into the car as quickly as possible, staring out of the window beside me. Luckily, the car was parked across the street from the school, and I didn't have to look at the school from my side of the vehicle. My dad got in and started the ignition, and his large form slummed down a bit when the car began to move away from the school. I knew he would say something soon, so I had to brace myself for it, but there was only silence at least for a while. When we had gotten reasonably far from the school, he cleared his throat and slowed the sedan into the traffic in front of us. You know we always try our best to help you, but, he said with a defeated sigh as he turned to look at my face. I tried to turn away, but my father always felt some way about looking away from him when he spoke. I didn't have a choice but to look at him. 
but it's hard to take care of someone like you. He looked away, focusing on the road before him. I, on the other hand, turned to face the window again. I felt tears leak from my face furiously. It would always be like this. I would always be a freak. I was going to be someone like you to everyone around me. I didn't ask for these abilities. Sometimes I wish they would go away. But like everything that happens just before you go to bed, it's real and stays. You only get that moment you're sleeping to wish it away. But as soon as your eyes open, you'll be faced with the cruel truth. This was my cruel truth. I'm sorry, I whispered as I cried silently, hoping he didn't notice I was crying. I was probably unaware that we had already gotten home, but I realized it quickly once the car door swung open and I came face to face with my mother. She stood, tall and proud, just like her husband. I always felt a stark contrast between her and me when I stood beside her. She was elegant, a sophisticated woman that everyone looked up to, and I, on the other hand, was rough and always getting into trouble. I wasn't elegant. Hovering over me with my father next to her, my mother seized me up and shook her head furiously. How many times would this happen? She boomed, her voice holding the anger I had just let go of a couple of hours ago. Honey, that always seemed to be the only thing we had in common. It's not my fault, Mom, I said. They were teasing me. What have I said about that? I let out a sigh and repeated the words she had constantly drummed into my ears. I should always report to a teacher around me. And did you do that? She asked. I already knew where this was heading. They don't understand, Mom, I said, a little bit irritated. No one does. Well, you have to stop acting like a brat, and then maybe someone will pay you to heed. You're an awful person, found myself saying. My feet seemed to work on their own, too. I found myself running out of the yard and into the streets beyond. My parents' cries for me to come back were lost in the sea of thoughts swimming in my head. I walked a long distance, taking a detour into the park, far from home, when I felt the need to stop and finally let it all out. I screamed as loud as I could into the empty park and finally cried, the tears falling nonstop. The sky seemed to call with me. There was a rumble and then a sudden downpour sending me running for shelter under one of the oak trees. I huddled up, crying my eyes out. Why me? Why are all these things happening to me? I felt a presence next to me and quickly lifted my head. Well, 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 if it isn't Miss Dragon Girl. A girl taunted me as she walked towards me. It was one of the teasers from my school that my blast hadn't injured. She came forward and a group of girls followed after I, I don't want any trouble, I quivered, backing further into the tree. I didn't want to start anything with these girls. We know, she replied. Get her, girls. It happened at once, and before I knew it, the girls were all over me. They were kicking and hitting me as I lay immobile on the ground. I felt the anger in me rise, and my body began to heat up. As the beatings became more intense, then I realized I couldn't attack. This is what my mother had yelled about, what my parents had been talking about. There was no teacher to report to, but I had to stay in check, so I laid quietly, the pain increasing with each blow I was given. The girls began to laugh, and their leader said, That's enough for today. She'll think twice about showing her ugly face around here ever again. The rain came down twice as hard as I laid bloody on the ground, the water washing over me. I kept thinking maybe this was it. I'd go into the light and never be bothered again, or perhaps they'd have to bother again. I felt the presence next to me. I didn't bother to look this time. I was sure it was one of the girls, back to do their dirty bidding. Why are you on the floor? A male voice called out. Are you crying, or is it just the rain? I didn't know who it was, but I didn't want anyone to see me in this state as I cried miserably. Please leave me alone. They've already done their part. I yelled, but he chuckled. You need a helping hand. He put his hand on mine, and I realized they were so warm. It was almost as if he had pulled them out of an oven. I looked up at his face and gasped. You, you're a, a, a d -d dragon, I exclaimed. He laughed again, lifting me off the ground. He put his hands on my wounds, and I began to feel the pain go away. 
You're a smart one, aren't you? He said over the loud sounds of water hitting the ground. Let's get you somewhere dry. In an instant, the rain stopped. I looked around us, and it was still raining, but it wasn't coming anywhere near us. It just fell around us. I marveled at this, forgetting the incidents that had just occurred. I had never seen magic up this close. I've been watching you, he said. You're special. I'm not. I'm a freak, I replied, turning away from him to face the park around me. My eyes were still focused on the rain. You're not a freak, if that's what you're trying to tell me. I am, I said, a little bit annoyed as I began to heat up again. I hated that no one could understand me. I didn't realize it, but I was releasing smoke, and I let out a little roar, and fire erupted from my hands. See? This is what I'm talking about, I yelled, the fire growing in my hands. I'm a freak. I'm the dragon girl who can't keep herself in check. He stared at me for a while, contemplating something, then walked towards me, placing a hand on my shoulders. Maybe you're different and can't keep yourself in check, but you're not a freak, Grace. You need somebody that understands you. He turned towards the sky and let out a roar, fire flowing out of his mouth into the clouds above. Come on, you give it a try, he urged. You've got marvelous fire techniques. I let out a little awkward laugh. No one had ever said that to me before. I let out a roar and fire erupted. He continued to laugh as he rose to the air. I knew what was happening. He was transforming into a full dragon. I looked away. You weren't supposed to look at them when they transformed. After, a bright light flashed. I knew he had changed. You're not so different, you know, he said again. I'm always here. 